So it's time to launch. Welcome, welcome colleagues and friends to this open online briefings offered by the ForestD Foundation. You might remember for those of you who were with us at its last iteration, these open online briefings are an evolution from the COVID online, open online briefings that David were, was uh, chairing in 2020 and 2022. I'm Florence Lesben, I'm the Managing Director of ForestD, and we've decided all together to build on the, open, the COVID open online briefing to enlarge a little bit, keeping on focusing on how the, the world is impacted by COVID, but of course, uh, taking into account all the crises that are coming. Today, our framing speaker will be Professor Sir David Nabarro, uh, who will take the floor just after my introduction. We were at Buckingham Palace last week, so <gasps> I thought I can use this title for once. David might not like it each time. <laughs> Today, David would like to dive into how to navigate multiple crises, how to look into the world as it is now. You've explored with David in the last two years of course, how the COVID pandemic has revealed many new uncertainties and exacerbated inequalities. And now with the challenges of the cost of living crisis, the difficulties to access food, energy, and other things, the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people and nations are even more likely to be left behind. In this context, how is living systems leadership helping us to make sense of this world and to find entry points to address those challenges? That's what David would like uh, to explore with us. So he will take the floor in a few seconds. And after David's uh, remarks, I will open the floor to all of you. Uh, please do raise your hand. That's the easiest manner uh, for me to identify those of you who want to take the floor. And uh, let me finish by my, intro uh, my introduction by welcoming Chris Shipton, you remember, live illustrator. Welcome, Chris, who will illustrate our conversation all along. So we'll also make some pause to look at your drawings, Chris. But without long ado, David, colleagues are connecting just as we speak, but I think it's time for you to offer your framing remarks. David. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's Florence. And uh, uh, thanks for mentioning uh, what happened last week. Uh, I just want to welcome my sister Annie and uh, her husband Keith, who are there, who were actually with us for some of the celebrations. I'd also like to give um, special shout outs to several of you who are here, uh, to Marianne and Karen, both of whom wrote to me during the last few few days. Thank you. To Fawzia Rashid, who I haven't seen for a long time, but you would be surprised, Fawzia, perhaps how often I'm thinking of you because of my um, deeper engagement in links between uh, climate change mental health and emotional resilience and i'm very very keen uh, to re reconnect with you on that to annie feltham and nigel lloyd hello again and to rebecca uh, i suspect in santiago but i'm never quite sure um to claire rayner who is actually out of hospital after a really tricky period and uh, and who has been very active in the long covid community many of whom came together through participating in earlier versions of this. I'd like to greet Sarah Phillips, who's been with us on a number of occasions, as well as Richard Longhurst. Denise, it's lovely to see you, as well as Ian Boyd, Georgina, hello, and Lily Evans, uh, Holly Wheeler, and um, um, uh, Emily Roper, Howard Taylor, Bernice Wittrich. Now, just to say that on this call are several colleagues from 4SD, as well as Florence, we've got Anya Donahue, Twee Marion, but special um, uh, comment, uh, welcome to John Atkinson, who will uh, no doubt um, uh, speak later when, if Florence brings you in. Uh, but I wanted also to thank John for being with us uh, uh, a little bit, along with Florence and me, last Friday. Um, to Karen, yes, uh, it was a, a very special moment. 
to be to be uh, recognized with this knighthood for work on global health is amazing and i think it's not just frankly to do with me if i look at the work that i've been doing uh, over the last four or five decades it's been as part of a much broader community what i call the giants on whose shoulders i stand uh, who work incredibly hard for equity for sustainability for resilience and do it because they care and because they believe that everybody deserves a, a, a equality of opportunity if at all possible and working with that community has been part of what's kept me not just going but excited and and joyful about this kind of work i think many of you would recognize it and i'm the lucky one who's got the prize but i think it's a prize for as i say for all of us I wanted to also say a very special hello to Chris Shipton. I know that Florence has already greeted Chris, but it's an absolute honor that Chris and team join us for these sessions. Today, I want to start by looking at the current global food, energy, and finance crisis. This is quite a quite a complex thing. It's it's not in any way a crisis that's easy to address because it's been building up actually over probably a two to three year period and uh, it's proving to be extremely difficult to deal with because its impacts are variegated it depends very much on where we're looking and also um, the particular groups of people who we're studying and it's that notion of of crisis is not the same for everybody and of course each crisis is different that is one that i want to really build off in these remarks Let, let's go to the background a, a series of interconnected shocks are, is affecting food energy health and finance systems globally and over the past few years, those shocks have included the COVID-19 pandemic, acceleration extreme weather events, including droughts and floods, a number of violent conflicts, including most recently uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, and high levels of inflation, rising interest rates, and high debt burdens. And these shocks are interacting to result in disturbances in an awful lot of systems on which people depend. And the ones that we are picking out in particular are food, energy, and finance systems. And the reason why I'm focusing on them is that I've been asked by the United Nations Secretary General to lead the food work stream of the uh, global crisis and uh, in leading that food work stream what we're doing is exploring how issues related to food issues related to energy and issues related to finance uh, to finance are coming together quite simply the shocks uh, that have occurred uh, particularly the conflicts and climate impacts have so jolted food energy and finance systems that every country and the people of every country are being affected and the effects have taken a little bit of time to disentangle the, the most profound effect is that tens of millions of households all over the world have been sliding into deeper and deeper poverty uh, and the costs of what they need for living have gone up the value of their income has gone down and the consequence is that the amounts of cash they have for living are reducing in some cases by 30 percent 40 percent or 50 percent of household income that's particularly the case for poor families, poor families that have a high level of dependence 
on uh, uh, high level of, of, of expenditure on food, perhaps spending 50% or more of their income on food, a high percentage of expenditure going on energy, and difficulties with accessing and maintaining finance uh, going deeper and deeper into debt. Now, what happens in, in our experience when households are sliding into poverty is that they will spend less on essentials like food or like health or like education if they can possibly get away with it. And in, when it comes to food, one of the main coping strategies is to buy less expensive, nutritious food, buy less vegetables, buy less fruit, uh, buy less meat, buy less eggs, buy less milk, and instead uh, make up with low cost uh, staples. And that in turn can have a really adverse effect on the nutrition, particularly of those who need a relatively high level of nutrition intake. That's pregnant women, small children, and actually older people as well. Now, how serious is this? Well, we, we don't know for sure, but just looking at figures on estimates of severely undernourished people in our world today, uh, the information that we've had, and it's built up over the last few months, is that there are currently um, around 360 million people who are living in what we call food security crisis conditions. That's a rather uh, special categorization, but it basically means people are in, in deep trouble and are in danger of becoming severely malnourished. Um, the seven places in our world where uh, this undernourishment is particularly pronounced include Haiti and northern Nigeria, Yemen, uh, southern Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, and so on. We're basically talking about the Horn of Africa and a number of emergency situations. I should have included Afghanistan. And um, the, the, these famine-like conditions, as they're reported, we, we tend not to use the word famine uh, unless we absolutely have to because it's such a, uh, a loaded um, categorization. But famine-like conditions are the extreme. And, and it's this tens of millions of households sliding into deeper poverty all over the world that is the main, main challenge. Now, not everybody is suffering from deeper poverty. If you go into any country, who are the people who are getting poorer? It's the already poor. And so the already poor getting poorer means that you're likely fairly quickly to have people who are just above the poverty line sliding below the poverty line, people below the poverty line are becoming seriously poor. And in any household, when sort of things like nutritious food or other valuable goods are being divided up between household members, the, the general pattern is that those who are earning, that's, and that's usually, but not always the men, uh, get the majority of the available food and that women and children, older people, uh, uh, people who are perhaps not primarily earning, uh, tend to get less food and certainly less nutritious food. And that in turn means that it's very likely in the present situation that the increase in levels of malnutrition is primarily going to be among women and children and older people. So this is what's happening in our world today. We've got increases in poverty, increases in malnutrition among women, children and older people. Uh, we've got real problems with accessing healthcare and accessing education all over the world uh, and uh, record numbers of people in extreme food insecurity. We've been tracking this situation, which we're trying to understand why it's so pronounced and, and we get the following information that actually things have been getting worse, as I said, for at least two years. And it is to do with the shocks that I described. But what we're seeing now is that on in global markets, food prices seem to be stabilizing and perhaps are starting to come down. And yet they're still pretty high 
especially in quite isolated locations where there's not a lot of competition for food, especially in low income countries, which have had to undergo a devaluation recently to cope with the fact that interest rates have gone up in uh, high income countries. And that in turn has reduced the the um, amounts of foreign currency that can be bought with local currency in many markets. So in our world today, the, the countries where the problems with increasing malnutrition and food insecurity and energy insecurity have been increasing are situations where uh, actually the capacity of countries to cope is particularly limited. And so if we if we look, there are about 95 countries that are really quite embarrassed by the present cost of living crisis. But there are 50 countries where the situation is really serious. And it's serious because the governments concerned are not able to find the foreign exchange in their bank accounts in order to be able to import the essential items that they need, maybe food, maybe energy, maybe fertilizer, maybe other goods. Uh, and in addition, they're not easily able to increase the amounts that they can pay to their people in social protection expenditure. And, and it is social protection that is the vital, vital pillar of efforts to try to ensure that when a, a, a tight situation occurs like the one we have at the moment, uh, you do not get everybody uh, becoming uh, extremely undernourished or extremely uh, destitute. Social protection is key. And for the poor countries in our world, maintaining social protection is difficult. The added problem right now is that there are 50 countries in our world at present who are facing, whose governments are facing difficulty with their debt service payments. They've already got debts, but the governments are finding that they can't even pay the interest on those debts. And so they have added problems of being able to borrow more money from development banks or other creditors. Uh, and um, they're also finding it difficult even to, to keep their governments going. And we, you've heard about Sri Lanka and perhaps Ghana and other countries that we know are having difficulty right now. And it's always a very tortuous process because then the government has to negotiate with the IMF to borrow some more money. Uh, but the IMF will say, yes, you can borrow money, but you've also got to put in place some reforms. And those reforms are usually associated with reducing government expenditure, which is unfortunate just at a time when governments of poor countries really need to be increasing their expenditure. In the past, if we look back after the Second World War or after the last food crisis of 2008 or the financial crisis that came just at that same time, what we find is that the world's financial system has responded to widespread indebtedness, to responded to increasing levels of food insecurity and associated with poverty by creating new mechanisms for moving money quickly to people in poor countries. That's not happening at anything like the rate that is necessary right now. And that's because the global consensus on what needs to be done to help tackle poverty is much weaker than it's been in, in recent years. And we are coming up to yet another crunch period, the spring meetings of the World Bank and IMF, where there will be further efforts by leaders of poor countries, particularly, for example, the Prime Minister of, of Barbados, Mia Motley, uh, who will come together at, at these events and try to put pressure on the leaders of the wealthy countries to uh, actually help them overcome their impoverishment. But the leaders of the wealthy countries on the whole are not minded to open up the tabs. And that's because they're super worried about the cost of the Ukraine war and they don't want to be um, um, kind of um, offering uh, more cash of their own to help out poor countries. And then there's a, a level of, of suspicion between the leaders of rich countries, which is much higher than we've had recently. So getting a consensus around the action needed to get more cash into poor countries is particularly difficult. And it's that that I want to focus on just in my last few minutes. 
What on earth's happening in our world right now that's making it harder and harder for governments to understand that we're in the midst of a really serious poverty crisis associated with uh, food security crises, associated with ill health, associated with energy shortages, associated with much deeper poverty, really, than we've seen for 20 years and perhaps 30 years. It's sort of building up. Um, why is it so bad? Well, I want to suggest that actually, I think the world has been scarred emotionally and socially by the COVID pandemic. And we still have not fully realized just how bad that scarring is. Now, why, why should that be the case? What, what is it about COVID that is particularly uh, peculiar? Well, COVID was not like any other infectious disease outbreak that I've ever dealt with. You know, we, we've never had in my living memory a coronavirus pandemic. There was the SARS outbreak in Southeast Asia in 2003, which was a coronavirus outbreak, a particularly difficult one. But the pandemics that we've had in recent years have tended to be associated with influenza. And much of the early thinking and working about COVID was based on models that used influenza. And the thing about influenza is that it is profoundly airborne, uh, although some people won't agree with me, and I'm saying this with care, it is my view that COVID is primarily droplet borne, sometimes can be airborne, but it's not primarily airborne. And that makes uh, for a rather different uh, containment strategy, which I'll explain. So it's a new virus spread a bit differently from the ones that we normally focus on when we're doing pandemic preparedness. It's also a virus about which there's been an awful lot of uncertainty. We didn't quite know how it was going to mutate. We didn't quite know what patterns, what rhythmic patterns of outbreaks would evolve. And, it, and it's a virus around which there's obviously been an awful lot of fear. We've had report, recorded deaths between six and seven million. Uh, we suspect that the actual number of deaths COVID linked is much greater. We've also got long COVID, which is presenting in multiple forms and does definitely seem to be associated, that's the post-COVID period, with higher incidence of disability, but also, unfortunately, higher incidence of severe illness and death in certain groups of people. And one of the other things that's been very clear about it is that, that, that at least for the first two years, and I think even now, there was not absolute consensus on how best to tackle COVID. So it's a problem about which uh, there was uncertainty, fear, and a degree of competition between different authorities. And, and that's led to extreme politicization of the COVID response. And that politicization has also created quite a lot of fear in the minds of people working in public health. It's super difficult if you are involved in trying to give interpretations and advice in a public setting to then cope with being directly attacked and accused of, of being a, a malicious person and so on and worse. Uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. It just means that it, it makes people quite un understandably a little bit cautious of speaking out and trying to do the right thing. Okay, well, that's, I mean, that's not a problem. But there's one other thing about COVID that I've said on these briefings on a few occasions in the past, and that is, the way in which the disease has affected people, whether it's the disease itself or its containment measures, or it's what actually happens in society when societies are affected by the disease, has been characterized by one remarkable and consistent reality, which is poor people have done much, much worse as a result of their COVID than wealthy people. The inequities are huge. The mistrust among poor people of authorities has been shown to be much greater uh, than it has been on just about any other issue. And, and this means that we've got a disease that also in a very overt way been associated with inequity. Now, I've noticed that. I expect many of you have noticed that. And I actually think that the vast majority of people in our world have come to the conclusion that when it's come to COVID, world leaders have tended to make sure that the rich do okay, whereas the poor have tended 
to have a, had a worse deal, whether it was trying to access vaccines or being able to get treatment or indeed being able to get benefits if they needed them. Now, I am posing to you a hypothesis that that inequity in the response to COVID has actually been remembered very starkly by people everywhere and may be a factor in the current cost of living crisis that we're seeing, the fact that this has become a rather deep crisis, that it's associated with big changes in the willingness of people to take on different kinds of jobs, much greater rigidity and stiffness inside systems everywhere, particularly affecting people on low incomes and people in the informal economy. And I'm just wondering, and I haven't reached the firm conclusion yet, I'm just posing it as a hypothesis, that some of the e extreme difficulties that we're seeing in the current cost of living crisis, particularly among poor people in poor countries, might have had exacerbation as a result of the inequities that have been associated with COVID and have been seen everywhere. Thanks for the chance to offer these remarks. I now pass back to Florence. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David. And you are all most welcome uh, to take the floor. Just a reminder that we are posting the recording of our open online briefings on our YouTube channel. If any of you were having some issues about appearing there, please be in touch with Tui in particular. She'll put her contact in the chat. But this being said, who would like to break the ice today? Uh, comment, react, um, contest, uh, what David was saying. Annie Feldham, you're most welcome. Please come in. Thanks, um, Florence. I just wanted to come back to where I began la at our last session when I was talking about gender. Um, and when you, I first, when you and I first met, David, I was very much a social developer and gender was our meat and uh, whatever. Um, and, and so I'm, and particularly of the age I am, I'm very distressed to be talking about it in the same light now, um, because it seems to me that globally we've gone backwards. And I'm very cautious about using the word globally because I, I, in my head I'm nailed into looking at the specifics of different contexts. And so it, it was quite shocking this week to have the early data coming out about how women are particularly vulnerable to physical and mental attack in the areas of the earthquake zone in Turkey and Syria. Um, and so it was in that sense that we want that we seem to be going backwards in a way where um, women are becoming particularly vulnerable in rich countries and in poor countries. Um, and um, it, it, the explanation for this, I, I'm sure is much more complex and is context specific, but the, the fact that it is all going backwards in, a, in quite a terrible way, whether it's the misogyny um, in the UK or Roe versus Suede in, in the US or what's happening in, uh, in many of the uh, Muslim countries, Iran, etc. Um, it's very difficult to find the explanation. There's no single explanation, but there is a, seems to be a, a single um, growth in this global issue. And yes, it is about it's about all sorts of inequalities, isn't it? But it seems to me that gender itself is currently leading to inequalities of power, of, of access to, to social and political goods um, in a way that a few years ago, um, I think I wouldn't be saying the same thing. Um, and when we're looking at, and I agree with you because with the work that I'm doing locally, we've known right from the get-go that, um, that the mental damage of COVID um, would be significant. And it, it has it. I think there's a general recognition of that now, um, and and the and the, uh, the fear of being amongst people and all those things that we've discussed in previous sessions, David. What I would just add for the UK is that it wasn't just with the start of COVID, because here we've had also the nastiness of nastiness of Brexit, and those two things interact on each other, um, and um, are just it lead to an extraordinarily parochial meanness 
and a global meanness. So I think that we in the UK are, I think in Michael Marmot's words, we should be ashamed of ourselves. Um, and I, I, you know, I certainly am, and it is a struggle. We can do things locally, and I think we are having some success, but actually lifting that up, so we're upscaling it so that there's an impact nationally, goodness me, that's difficult. And so I would also say that um, women aren't, uh, women and girls aren't doing very well in the UK either. And so th thank you, Fl Florence, for letting me come in first, because I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm old enough to find this really distressing to have a conversation now that, you know, of the 70s and 80s, God, I thought we might have moved beyond this and we haven't. And it is terribly disturbing and I thought important uh, that you were offering this gender lens indeed on our topic of today on the week of uh, Women's Rights uh, Day, obviously. Thank you so much, Annie. Uh, can we have a look at your picture, Chris, while John Atkinson is preparing his remarks? Do you want to comment, Chris? Oh, yeah, no, I am just uh, uh, had some cable trouble. Um, I just have one thought listening to all of this is that, you know, when, when you sort of listen to what people are talking about and you try and turn it into an image, um, sometimes when I sort of work with people, we have canvases. And we have these kind of structured diagrams where we use post-it notes to fill, fill stuff in. And look, here's one I created earlier. I don't know if you can see this. Very this well. Is, this is the organizational operating model vision and strategy template. It's pretty much everything in a kitchen sink. I was just wondering how on earth do we um, come up with a template to fit in all of the thorny problems we're discussing now but you know maybe that's one for me to take away and think about but that's a beautiful framing to invite john in particular and i see david ready to jump also uh how on earth do we reconcile a messy world and a, a post-it way to organize our work or our own organizations. John, what does it trigger on your mind, please? Yeah, that's something to trigger, isn't it? How do you organize the world through post-its? Um, so I, you know, I think I'm looking, listening to all of this um, through, a, well, what, 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 how would I, how would I take it? What, what was it triggering me? First, you can't understand a big, complex, messy environment, you call it a system, if you like, solely by focusing on one bit of it. If you just go, look, this is the thing that interests me, and I'm going to focus on that and try and fix it. What you miss is that in an interconnected world, it's the relationships between things that are the roots of the unintended consequences of what we do. And often our interventions in systems actually end up perpetuating problems as much as they might be impactful in the short term. So I'll give you an example of an interconnected thing that we came across in COVID. Um, and it came from saying, well, what's really going on here? How do we know what's happening? We, we, you know, David told us COVID emerges in, in little spikes of infections, which if we find them quickly, we can suppress them. But as they start to merge together into clusters, they become surges. Then suddenly healthcare systems are getting overrun. And we look to say, well, where, where are the spikes taking place? Where are most spikes taking place? And we found a number of settings where they were taking place. But amongst them, meat processing plants, warehousing, distribution, and care homes. Three very different things on the face of it but connected by a common thing in, in certain countries and that is the employment rights of the people who are working there so the people working in those settings generally aren't employed on full-time contracts they didn't get sick pay and so if they didn't work they didn't bring in an income and more than that they're probably living in housing uh, where lots of people are living living there in the same place all trying to all on the same sorts of work, all doing the same sorts of contractual stuff. So when you started to feel, oh, we've got a bit of a throat, um, you thought, I, I really hope it's not COVID, or if it, if it occurred to you, uh, but you certainly didn't say anything. And then a bit later, it, it seems to get a bit worse, and it seems to get a bit worse, and you try and cover it up, and you try and hold on, because you know that if you don't show up in work, you don't get paid. And you know that if you're caught in the COVID tracking system, and it pings all your friends who are living with you, they don't get paid either. And suddenly you're all, you're all in trouble and you're not popular. Uh, so what happens is you don't tend to tell anybody until 
you know, eventually somebody, somebody contact traces and finds you, by which time it's too late and it's spread. So one of the real triggers of the spread in some of the outbreaks of COVID was employment legislation. It was how we employed people on very low wages that didn't give them the option, didn't give them the opportunity that those who were employed who were, or who were better paid had to do the right thing uh, to prevent the spread of a disease. And we saw that in lots and lots of places. So you've got a, 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 an issue that's presenting itself as COVID and the, 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 uh, an underlying systemic issue about how we employ people and how we value people doing some of the, some of the less wonderful jobs perhaps in society. So when David says this, you know, there's houses who, for whom 50% of their income goes on food, you can look at that through a food lens. But I know from, from, from sitting in those houses that the big choice usually is about fuel. It's usually we're not going to buy food that we have to cook because putting the oven on is a complete no, one ring on the hob, possibly. And we know that we're probably on a prepaid fuel meter if we're in if we're in the UK, for example, where we pay a higher rate for our fuel than anybody else. So it drives us into all sorts of interconnected choices. And the only way you can make sense of how to move these sorts of systems is to stop looking at it through the lens of the problem and start looking at it through the lens of the people and the geography they're in, the place they're in. And then you start to be able to make sense of what might be done. And it's never easy and it's never simple and it's always interconnected. And so there isn't a post-it way of, of, of fixing it that says this is the vision and this is the values and this is the strategy and then these are the actions and these are the KPIs that are going to fix it. It becomes a dialogic process where each time we make better sense of what, what's needed here right now, sometimes at the level of family, sometimes at the level of community. And then it's, as it's to use the phrase that David and I have worked with over time, one step at a time, but with the direction in mind that we want to go. And so it's an evolving strategy that takes us through this kind of mess. That's me, Franz. It always sounds easy when we hear you and so well articulated, John, but we all know it's tricky and difficult to do in, in practice. Any comments on your own experience, colleagues here? Uh, there's also interesting comments in the chat, Claire, if you want to come in. Please, yes, let's hear Claire right now. Um, I mean, I don't have any great insights. I just think it's true what David says that people do seem to be in a level of denial or not understanding how serious the current issues are. And obviously I think as human beings, it's easier not to see those things. And so that's part of it. And I'm sure that that's true about COVID having left a degree of scarring. I think people are angry for various reasons. But I also think we in countries like the UK and other places have had a um, long period of relative prosperity, um, you know, or without huge wars or, you know, the, and I think there's something about that as well. I think people have become a lot of people I know are very individualistic. You know, the first priority after COVID and things, you know, have relaxed a bit is to have to fit several holidays in, in a year and things like that. And I know that's not everybody, but it seems that priorities are very individualistic. And I somehow think things are going to have to hit people worse before we get more of the community solutions back. I'm, I'm not a pessimist, I'm never a pessimist, but I think that sense of individuality, and I'm all right, Jack, which is part of you know people and countries, is, is maybe part of the problem as well. And I do feel people may need to have a few more shocks, but I don't mean that people that are already, as David says, suffering most. I don't, it's not a very great insight, but I just think people haven't seen really terrible stuff for many generations in, in some countries. And I think we're gonna to have to really face it at some point. I think it's such an important point. Thank you so much, uh, Claire. B, I see you have your hand up, but I have promised the floor to Nigel Lloyd. I'm coming to you after Nigel B. Nigel, the floor is yours. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of things that I think David hasn't added to his list, but he might consider. One of them is water and pollution. I'm not sure if that's one or if that's two, but I think they're of similar significance to food. 
and another is misinformation which seems to have become a very significant feature and the last one is democracy i think that the problems with democracy were becoming clear or there were problems becoming clear with democracy before covid started and the fact that we need to respond collectively to almost all the things we've talked about and have been getting worse at doing so is because somehow democracy has no longer been working as well as it should be and it's meaning that we have greater inequity and people who are in power or who have power are not necessarily looking after the majority of people which promotes inequity and um, i'd like to just add a couple of other bits one is that i have this horrid feeling that for certain people the covid and um, other things are actually a way of coping with the population i think that the fact that russia has been putting large numbers of its prison population into the army has saved them a lot of money it's removing people from their prisons i worry that the same is true of people allowing old of countries allowing old people in care homes to die it removes an unproductive part of the population and this is very cynical but i'm afraid that i think that this may be happening but to end on a happier note one of the things of being older is that i've actually seen certain countries transform in my lifetime and copy offer you norway which used to be a very poor country and is now a very rich country but remembers what it was like being poor and therefore does its best to be helpful and singapore which when i was a child living there was definitely a third world country the laborers were women building the houses okay end of rant this is our style on those open briefings we welcome all your thoughts the rants the nice vignettes and more than that thank you so much nigel i have uh, promised the floor to b and i will go to sarah phillips after b b Wittrecht, that's your turn I, um, yeah, so I guess I will uh, continue the rant. <laughs> but uh, what I was thinking, you know, in terms of some of the comments is that when you look at the places of employment and, you know, where people are being uh, actively discouraged from taking off work when they're sick, um, you're looking at least, well, both in the US and globally, you're looking at uh, populations of um, not only poor people, but you know, black people and brown people. And um, so in the US, there's the racial dimension of, of class. I think that that's consistent globally. Um, if you look at the recent study that shows you know, the rise of uh, food-related disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, it's particularly affecting uh, low-income countries. And so what I think we also need to consider is uh, the structure of racial capitalism, which is the theory that capitalism cannot exist without racism. And unless we consider that and the implications of that, I think it'll always be a perpetual catch-up game in terms of the problems that the world is facing. And I would venture that there's also, um, you know, a gender capitalism, gendered capitalism. Can capitalism exist without the discrimination against women? And not just discrimination, but what we're seeing is a wholesale effort to disenfranchise women in every way. So, the trouble with, with those theories <laughs> are that they really challenge us to come up with an alternative um, because I don't think the world has found one yet. Um, and that's, that's part of where I think we have to direct our thinking 
And that may include reconsidering how we value wealth, how we value um, gross domestic products. What is the GDP of the poor? How do we value nature? How do we start to put in place in fact, in reality, and in our minds, a different um, system of, of value uh, that is one that's truly based on equity. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, B. Quite, quite a challenge, but I think many people here would uh, agree on the necessity to reconsider wealth and the way people and nature are valued and women amongst people in particular. Thank you very much, B. Let's turn to Sarah before going to Howard. Sarah Phillips, please. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to feed back some of the things that I've been trying out since I think it was January meeting in the, what is the integrated care system? So that's uh, quite a big area in Nottingham, Nottinghamshire. I've got a lead role there and I've been working with the directors, associate directors um, and organizational development role really um, in Nottingham. So one of the, one of the a few things are quite interesting as well. So I've been using, um, so for example, when we talked about encouraging dissonance, that's going down well. So people are just straight away into that. And we talked about um, systems thinking, encouraging the confidence in systems thinking. People qu quickly retreat back, want to go back into me mechanistic thinking. Um, and by using this, the thinking here and the things that John said and things that David said and everybody's joined in with, having that confidence in what that is, and obviously my background has, has really helped. And one of, one of the things I say is, uh, and that's going down really well, is there's not enough Gantt charts in the world to do this. And it seems to land really well with the chairman and the directors and stuff. So where they start to go, oh, we've got to organize it and, and do things, saying that seems to land well um, of whatever. And the one, the other thing that holds really well as well is the um, all systems are under pressure. Uh, so when, when Dave talked about all systems are under pressure globally, it really helped contain some of the directors. And then that, that went forward, particularly in primary care, where we've got quite a bit going on at the moment. So that, that and that was, and I said it in, I, I run some groups like, um, well, I support some groups, um, kindness, culture and civility. And that one, they were very interested, which is interesting, isn't it? Because I think if we can get to that, they're going, you know, they're, they're really interested in the leadership group. So I think really that's probably enough. And I've sent a note through and I can come back to anything at any point, but those those kind of key things that we've been talking have been trying. Oh, and NHS England as well. Anywhere I've got a chance to get influence, uh, but it's um, it's working, and some of the things are landing really, really well. And so, thank you for the confidence in using things as well, because of the understanding that is gained from coming here. So, thanks. This is beautiful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And that resonates very strongly here. That makes me think of the comment from Karen in the chat just after John spoke. It is so comforting to remind ourselves that it is messy. And in the same spirit as what you were saying, Sarah, the world is not a gun chart. But I hear David, John reminding our interlocutors so often that it is messy and it will remain messy whatever we are doing, and if it looks different, it's that there's something wrong in our interpretation rather than the world. Thank you so much. Let's turn to Howard Taylor, please. Howard, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks, Florence. And just to introduce myself, this is the first time I've managed to join one of these. Uh, Howard Taylor, I'm, I'm dialing in today from New York. I'm with the UN Partnership and Fund to End Violence Against Children. Uh, first of all, congratulations, David. Let me just join that chorus. I, I joined a couple of minutes late, but congratulations on your night here. David and I were former colleagues from about 25 years ago in DFID. Uh, and I don't know the rules of this conversation are that we throw out really insoluble things for you to solve for us, David. But anyway, I'll, I'll throw a few thoughts into the mix, if I may. And I've enjoy, enjoyed and learned from the conversation so far. Um, if I may just talk about the little the little piece of this in interconnected, messy, complex world and, and systems that we're in uh, that I currently work on, which is violence against children, um, where, of course, what we've seen in, in, this, in the so-called poly crisis is a significant increase in, in different forms of violence and abuse of children. I won't rehearse them. I won't rehearse the data now in the interest of time. But at the same time, we've seen a declining attention. Uh, we've seen a decline in many places in availability of both domestic budgets, but also international finance. Um, and I've even seen, I think, in, in the last year or so, 
um, some of the collaboration which has developed in the last decade or more in the international environment, both globally but also cascading regionally and, and sometimes at national level, is also fragmenting. Um, so with, and I know I've seen, we, we see the same on other issues, so I just use that as illustrative, I think, of what we see on some other issues where there's been progress and now we see a pause or in some places using a reversal. And just, I'm just thinking through with, the, with these very gnarly, messy issues of, of, that we all care about so much. Um, and, you know, how we, how we craft the substance and the narrative, if you like, that's real, that's sufficiently compelling, but is real about the issues we're leading into, um, where we can actually make progress. And some of the thinking we've been doing as, as, a, as a global partnership and fund is around the gains that we've collectively made in the last 10 years, what do we know enough about the works, recognizing we are in, in a, what seems to be a very fluid new normal um, and that, that constant need to adapt and that, that recognition of that, but the embracing of that collectively. Secondly, the collaboration, because my, as I say, I fear I see a sort of elbows out fragmenting or dilution of some of the collaboration that has developed in the last 10 years or so internationally and regionally and even nationally and how, how, we, how we lean in to try and preserve some of those pieces and then being really realistic about trying to move different pieces forward at different times according to what's politically, economically, operationally feasible. But I'll tell you that it's a challenge and I have, I have a lot of pushback on that with people saying that's just being, you can't just be opportunistic, but in some senses that new normal, the adaptation, you have to be op opportunistic to a sense, but also of course it has to be uh, in, in some senses, you know, it, with a coherence of strategy as well as this constant pivoting on, on tactics, et cetera. So I guess, I don't, I don't think it's one question for you, David. I'm, you know, your, your answers on all the other things and, and your comments earlier were really were, were, were as, as insightful and as thoughtful and, and helpful as ever, but it's just thinking through and, and as a fellow leader, with others on, on the call. It, it's the struggle of leadership at the moment, whether it's just like leadership of self, leadership of team, leadership of, of organization, partnership and everything else. It's, it's that balance of um, not just the what you should be doing, but it's, it's the, the crafting, as I say, of the substance and the narrative um, around what is, what is possible and what is realistic and what we can get done in this really difficult chapter. And I was encouraged by some of the comments from others earlier with a longer perspective than I may have, you know, and just thinking, oh, are, are we in a cycle globally in humanity? Are we on a downturn that's going to come up? What is the pathway out of this? And I don't mean just for violence against children. I mean, what is the pathway out of where we are for humanity? And where are those, those tributaries, if you like, to that stream that hopefully will become a river in the years to come that gets, that gets humanity out of where it currently is? Um, and I think that's what we're all wrestling with. So I don't know if that's, if that's useful or additive, but really, really grateful to join. And I will make an effort to join more regularly in future. Thank you. Thanks, Florence. Please do so, Howard. Uh, you absolutely understood the principles of this space. We are thinking through issues together. It's not just David, uh, but of course, David's reflections are always helpful to all of us. But others are helping us thinking those complex issues together. And Holly, in particular, is helping us and sharing her own experience uh, when she can. Holly, can you take the floor now? Yes, to you. Hello, it's lovely to see you and to hear you all. Um, I've had a particularly bad week, so it is so good to be with people that are uh, honest and loving. And those are the two things that I kind of hold on to. I thought I'd share a couple of thoughts. The first one um, is, the kind of practice that I'm noticing is needed at the moment and the grief, the grieving that's needed. So I think one of the things that's going on at the moment is about the fact that we didn't do a proper grieving process during COVID. And that is particularly hard for some of us about it because we're not grieving for things that are tangible. We're grieving for things that we are um, that we've lost that were absences, things that we expected to happen that, that didn't. And that's at every level from, you know, birthday parties and funerals to, you know, work growth and succession and changes in organisations. So there's all of those things going on. And I've started a piece of work um, in South London. And what we're looking at is partially that process that hasn't been attended to and the thing that David was talking about earlier in terms of this complete lack of trust in institutions. So there's a huge inequality, particularly in terms of race, and that was very clearly manifest 
in uh, COVID and now it's being manifest in the process of dealing with the cost of living. And how do we really address that? And how do we be deeply honest about our previous relationships and kind to everybody involved so that we can choose to be braver? And that that's the question that we're working on at both a very high level in terms of they're, they're very senior people with lots of lots of influence and money, uh, but also in terms of saying to them, Sarah, I love you. Enough with the Gantt charts. We're going out to meet some real people. Let's go and have some real dialogues some real conversations. So that when Sarah said that and when John was talking about it's emergent and you need to go to the real experience, that really connected with me today. So uh, I thought I'd share that and just share my gratitude for being with you today. It's lovely to see you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Holly. Thank you for what you've shared uh, that resonated with many people. You might not see the chat, but uh, several colleagues, Karen Palmer, Rebecca Cantor, uh, Karen also, anyway, uh, are sharing more, more thoughts and, and uh, resources actually around grieving. So, so important. Thank you, Holly. I keep the eye on the clock. We are already three minutes uh, to the end. I want to go to Chris, who has found a solution to John's problem. So I want to see that, of course, before inviting John to react and finishing with Professor Sir David. Chris. Well, yeah, okay. I was just thinking like the process thing. Let me demonstrate. So yeah, I did a lot of innovation workshops. And when you do an innovation workshop, so if you have like a problem here and a solution there, and you just go from here to there, that's just that's a process. So John was saying, well, it's not a, it's not an A to B process. I think that's what you're saying anyway. I was thinking when we do these innovation workshops, what we do, whoops, wrong, wrong, wrong thing is we have we have part one where we have a sort of starting point and we throw open loads of ideas. And then we have a middle point where we sort of navigate the ideas. And then we've done so much at the end, we kind of find our B at the end. But when you start at the beginning, you have absolutely no idea where you're going at all. And it's only by creating this middle bit of sort of chaos exploring all these ideas you land on b this final bit you know your solution here does that make sense or am i going completely off piece but i think you know maybe if the world is essentially organized chaos this sort of beginning middle and end process is sort of one of the ways you can get through it obviously um i've really only uh used this in the world of fast moving consumer group uh, goods uh, and that being, um, in this instance, cheese. But, uh, you know, just a thought. This is beautiful, Chris. John, how do you react to that? Well, it's great, actually. I mean, the, I think the challenge when you move from cheese to people uh, is that one grows and creates stuff, uh, perhaps other than mould. And so, But cheese can even do that. But this idea that you need you need to open up a space whereby... Uh, you know, lots of stuff that we don't know whether it's relevant or it's not or it's valuable or not. But it, but it's, you know, people's experience, emotion, feeling is data alongside everything else that we're learning that we can maybe measure more more closely. Um, so my, my take on that is sounds great and keep the sense of direction to it. it. It's not that we don't know where we're going at A. We just don't know what B is. We know B is over there somewhere. And that's sort of where we want to head. But how we get there, we still got to figure out. And as I think Sarah said in the chat, you know, it, in a complex problem, you never you never finish it. It's never it's never done. And what you get to at B is R. So this is the next question. This is the thing we have to go to next. Now we've got to this point and I've brought it all back together. We understand that our next step needs to be and how do we address that now, whatever the, that is. And so, yeah, that's, that's really helpful, Chris. And, uh, you know, I think when we start working with complexity in this way, we always end up holding together two things that actually appear to be contradictions. But that we that we need that, but we need to be able to work with both at once. It's a both and situation. So in 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 the case of, of Chris's diagram, uh, it's chaos and order. That's a way of holding both chaos and order together. And as I was describing, sometimes you need to hold the local and the global together. And the, at times these things these things like feel like contradictions. But the real space comes when you can hold them both at once. So that's me. Superb. Thank you, John and David. 
uh, maybe not the solutions to all the challenges that have been expressed, but your final remarks. for Yeah, thank you. First of all, uh, an hour is just a little taste of what we could do if we had longer together with each other. The ways of thinking and working that John exemplifies, but all of you are, are in fact contributing both in what you say and in the chat, these ways of thinking and working are absolutely key for the future. And for many, we have to unlearn many of the, uh, a number of the sort of facts and approaches that we learnt when we were younger in order to be able to cope with the realities of life. Sarah Phillips said that the kind of work she's doing is associated with discomfort and that she's got some basic principles and axioms that she's sharing in order to help people make sense of that discomfort. And perhaps that's what John does all the time for us. He's the most brilliant sense maker and, and we all want to have little Johns or whatever uh, alongside us to help us through things. In the end, my suggestion is that all of us try to apply as much of this living systems thinking and working into our lives. We do everything we can to connect with people, as Holly said, with love and with compassion. We know that if we tighten up and we become rigid and we become uh, a transactional in how we work with others, the way in which we work in, as individuals or in teams is less adaptive, less fluid, less elastic, less capable of uh, adjusting to new realities. And, and that's what really matters. So I think we should keep as far as possible connecting when we've got time with people who think like we do uh, and use these moments as, as periods of rejuvenation of regeneration and of re-inspiration so that we can go on. Because unless we can take solace from listening to each other, we will find over time that we get exhausted by what we're trying to do. We're on a good track. We go around the world and we look and we find that people who think in this open people and place-centered way, as John described it, are the people who, in our view at least, have some of the keys to creating the world of the future that can deal with climate, can, can deal with the destruction of nature, and that can deal with everything that's thrown at it through the best capacities of humanity. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Big, big thanks to Chris Shipton, who is, as you probably gathered, becoming a more and more important uh, member of our team. And thanks to John, to Florence, and all else from 4SD, who've made this happen. We look forward to seeing you in about a month. Thank you, Flo. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you to all of you. A reminder to send a little note to Tui, uh, who is also helping us uh, running those open online briefings, if you'd rather that we cut your intervention before we post on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your engagement. Stay well and uh, kind to each other. Bye-bye for now.